Hey there everybody, ever felt like you're nailing it and are totally having a tremendous career? However, when it comes to investing, it feels like you're reading a book upside down? Welcome to Breaking Your Golden Handcuffs podcast, where we educate, inspire, and hopefully along the way, assist you to transform those commission checks and bonus checks and every other check you get into financial freedom. Every week, we'll deep dive into the world of investing literacy. Being uninvolved in your investing life will not get you to financial independence. And I'm here to guide you step by step from understanding the basic to mastering the advanced strategies. Stay informed, stay empowered, and I'll catch you on the next episode of Breaking Your Golden Handcuffs. Hey everybody, David McElwain with another episode of Break Your Golden Handcuffs. Today I'm really excited to have with me Frank Rowe. Frank is the CEO of Onify, and you probably haven't heard of Onify, but we're going to make sure that we change that today. Frank originally hails from Germany. Germany. Early attempts at becoming a child prodigy violinist were unsuccessful which forced his parents to abandon any hope or supervision. Accordingly, left to his own, Frank quickly became famous for wrestling rattlesnakes and kayaking, that kind of guy. His sister, meanwhile, became a child prodigy violinist. And looking for a brighter future, Frank moved, of course, to California, where his first job was a choice between watering marijuana pipes in the northern California mountains or building a neural network-based prediction engine for horse racing results. Ever focused on doing the right thing, he, of course, built the neural network for horse racing. Several other lucky turns led him to stay in the U.S. and eventually graduated from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania with a B.S. in economics. Since then, he's been a consultant at Oliver Wyman, started an online insurance company, spent four years at FICO, and grew Nomis from less than $2 million to over $25 million in annual revenue before selling it. His most recent challenge is building Onify, a new path to ownership for the approximately 2 million first-time home buyers each year. And ever since watching Forrest Gump, Frank's been running. He's completed marathons on the North Pole in Antarctica, on the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu, along the Himalayan ridge between India and Nepal, and around the Cape of Good Hope. His goal is to complete a marathon on every continent before his other passion, currywurst and Kolsch, makes that impossible. Did I say Kolsch right? Pretty close, Coach. Yep, it's Coach, a, okay. you pull out on the O, uh, but close enough. You, you, if you order that, you'll get one in Germany. Okay, well, I'm I'm close enough redneck to where I don't try to speak any good German. So, Frank, welcome to the show. Quite the, uh, quite the uh, bio. I love it. When well, I saw that, I, I've never had anyone read it to me, so you know that was a bit embarrassing. But um, I'm glad you like it. Thanks for having me. You bet. So, my daughter just sailed around the Cape of Good Hope. Oh wow! And she just finished a semester at sea. How was the um, uh, how was the marathon? It was long, and I didn't realize this. It's actually an ultra marathon, fifty six k, so it's fourteen kilometers longer than the traditional forty two kilometer, right? So, had an, an extra nine miles or so. Um, and, and that extra nine miles hurt a great great hurts. deal. It hurts at the end, exactly, but. Uh, you start at night, and it's fascinating because it's all in Cape Town itself, and you start from one end, which is the Atlantic Ocean, and you run to the Indian Ocean around the Cape of Good Hope, and it's just, the views are phenomenal, the support along the way is great. Uh, it's called the Two Oceans Marathon. Um, so, yeah, I really enjoyed that. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a couple of others, and they, generally what I've done is, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty big guy, and I'm not very fast, so I try to find those marathons where you can have fun, you can go slow, you enjoy the views, you enjoy the crowds, right? And that one was one of those, and it was really hard. And and, and someone along the way tapped me on the shoulder and said, you got to keep running, otherwise we have to put you in the bus. And I look behind me, and it's the bus that picks up the stragglers. So that the sag you know, wagon. You <laughs> <laughs> an idea of how fast I was, you know, and, and from that point on when I ran a little better. But, um, yeah, it was, it was a good time. Yeah, it's awesome. I have a fantasy of retiring to, to Cape Town, and uh, my wife is not on page, so I need to, you know, get her to run the, the marathon of two oceans and see if I can't get her <laughs> on page for that. So welcome to the show. I'm curious, have you ever had golden handcuffs? I have, um, and I thought about it, obviously, you know, coming on to, onto your pod. Um, I started my career in consulting, and then went into FICO, which was product management, credit risk, you know, consulting. And then I joined this company, Nomis, which is the company uh, prior to this, to Onify. Um, <laughs> and I joined that company as head of sales and marketing. And so that's a glorified way of saying I was the salesperson. And you know what that's like, right? You're constantly on the treadmill. You're running after 
prospects and clients and deals and renewals. And this is this is enterprise software selling to big banks. And so we build it. Nomus is, is the pricing engine for a lot of the large mortgage lenders, unsecured lenders, you know, uh, big banks. So you're selling into these big, huge sales cycles that take forever. But when you large win Large enterprise sales. Large enterprise no, sales. No immediacy, no immediate gratification. Yeah, Correct. I'm very familiar with them. <laughs> yes. And, but when you win them, the, these deals can be very large and they can be very rewarding. So I had, you know, that, that kind of golden handcuff situation where I would work on these deals for, you know, a year or sometimes two years at a time and, and maybe longer. And then you get a big commission check at the end and that's your reward. But, and the way the structure works is that uh, some portion of that always stays as a, you know, second and third and maybe fourth year. Uh, recurring commission. So that's your golden handcuffs. But right. you realize that I'm working and I'm making a good amount of money, which is great. Um, but I'm A, still working for that paycheck, right? So uh, it requires constant running on the treadmill, so to speak, not the marathon, but the treadmill. And, and, and in order to keep uh, you know more paychecks and more commission checks coming, you have to keep hustling. So that was, and, and, you know, I enjoyed that. And there's, you know, I think nothing wrong with that until you realize it is a set of golden handcuffs and it prevents you from doing things maybe that you want to do that are, that are maybe more aligned with where you want to take your career. Um, and so, yes, I did have those golden handcuffs for a good amount of time. And, and then I became the CEO and so I put the handcuffs on someone else. Um, and right. that helped. I can tell you, I really relate to that. Having been a sales executive and a sales leader for a long time and a guy carrying a bag as well. You get to that point, you get the, ma the macro accounts, you can't leave them. Yeah. And you're, you're, that's part of what brought this pod to, to light was I want to give other people a viewpoint that when you are in this position of success, there's more out there than the negative that, that you can have. You have alternative choices like making passive investments in real estate, which is how but the genesis of building this became. Yeah. So yeah. That, that takes me obviously to ownify. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. What is it? So, um, so there's a story here where, you know, I was working for this company, Nomis, and as I mentioned, selling pricing engine software to these big banks and lenders, including a lot of the large mortgage lenders in the U.S. and Canada and elsewhere. And, um, and after I uh, kind of graduated out of sales into being the CEO, you know, spent more time on the product and, and the roadmap and all that. And one of the things that became apparent, especially in the last couple of years, was that the first time home buyer in the US is getting squeezed out more and more. It's getting harder and harder for young people to buy their starter home, right? And we were seeing this in the data because we we're running the software engine for these lenders. And when we dug into this, realized that the the way we buy homes in the US, right, through a traditional mortgage, which is largely a government created and backed and sponsored product, um, is great if you can get to the down payment. Right, and afford that and afford the monthly payment. But it it creates a number of challenges in particular for first time buyers. And so I saw this kind of, you know, in my role there and then eventually decided to do something about it. Um I had sold Onify, so I had the ability to leave. I'm oh, sorry, I had sold Nomis. Um so I had the ability to leave. Um and the golden handcuffs kind of became a little looser, right? In the sense that that was now possible. And so Onify is really a combination of one, the realization that there's a big problem um, that needs solving and that hasn't been solved. Right? How do we create a better on-ramp for first-time home buyers? Two, the realization for me personally that you know helping big banks make more money is great, but it's not the be-all and end-all and ultimate goal of my career. So I wanted to do something that actually helps people and and pursue that passion. Um, and three, I realized I have the wherewithal and the knowledge of the mortgage industry. I spent 15 years in the bowels of mortgage math, um, to actually solve this problem. Right. And so I went out, she went back to the venture capital firm that funded my prior company, uh, told them about the idea of fund called Lobby Capital. These guys have been fantastic supporters. And so they see funded Onify about two years ago, and we've been working on this problem now for, you know, for two years. Um, which is how do we create this on ramp? How do we enable first time home buyers to buy a starter home in the US? And as part of that, we actually then, and this is where it comes full circle a little bit, um, we've we've created a 
value proposition for investors that generates passive income, capital appreciation in real estate, right? Which is why this is, I think, a, um, a good fit to talk about here as well for, for the investor side, right? Um, so what we've done is we've basically challenged this notion of how do you buy a house in the US? And um, traditionally, you do it with a mortgage. And we said, why do you have to, first, the question we ask is, why do you have to buy 100% of the home? and take on this mountain of debt to do it. Why couldn't you just buy a fraction of the home that you live in, right? A quarter, a tenth, maybe 1%, maybe even less, right? Well, just to make it the time, give the general answer is I want to use 100% of the home. Correct. So and having those time. fractional homes in the past as, an, as a, a second home, I could only use it every fourth week. Right. So if you think about fractional ownership, right, what does that mean in the U.S.? For most people, it means some version of timeshare or some version of, you know, I have to pick a time or I get a window or I get, you know, maybe I only get a couple of rooms in a bigger house, but it's a limited ability to use it. So, so what we had to figure out is how do you buy a fraction of the home while also being able to use the entire home, right? And so it's really taking apart the notion of what ownership means. Ownership is one occupancy, right? It's to the economic rights. Um, can you mortgage it? Can you sell it? Can you you know, lease it out, et cetera. The whole, whole um, bundle of rights that we talk about, all five of them. The bundle of and, rights, and, exactly. And, so and the bundle realtor. of rights also includes uh, use. Right, you know, exactly. And quiet enjoyment. And right. it, there's a, and we can go to the weeds here, listeners, but the reality is that what he's talking about is that when you buy land, you really buy a bundle of five rights. You're not actually buying the land. Correct. Contrast and if you want to go into this, hit, yeah. hit me with a comment offline and let's dive in. Right. Exactly. So, so we we took that bundle of rights apart and then put it back together in a different format. That is the the legal structuring answer here, right? And so, what we said was, well, what if we could allow someone to pick a home, live in it, and buy the home brick by brick? So, imagine you could break a home into ten thousand bricks, right? Even a home that's made out of sticks, you could theoretically break it into ten thousand pieces. So, we call these pieces bricks. Each piece is uh, one basis point or one hundredth of a percent. And so if you think about a $400,000 home, right, a brick, 10,000 bricks, one brick would be worth $40. What if we could create a structure that allowed a customer to pick a home, we purchase it for them, they live in it, and they buy bricks over time, right? So they accumulate their stack of bricks and grow it. And at the same time, investors hold the balance, the remaining bricks. And since I need to live in the home, I need to have 100% of the usage rights, I would probably pay rent or have to pay rent for the use of those remaining bricks, right? And so that's the structure we've built. We, we started out with this question of, could you fractionalize the home purchase and structure it as an equity-based path, right? Where the customer buys equity over time, but doesn't have a mortgage balance, doesn't have the obligation to ever buy the entirety of the bricks, right? You could keep going as long as you want. You could stop. You could potentially reverse it as well and sell bricks back to investors. And so, if you want to build that, and so we've we've you know worked on this for a year, what we're effectively building is this notion of fractional ownership in bricks of uh, of single family homes in the U.S. Right, and the way we use that is to create what is effectively an on ramp for first time home buyers, where we've built a program that says to the first time buyer. You can pick a home, so starter homes, right? Three, four, five hundred thousand dollar homes. Totally depends yeah. on the marketplace and the market price. It depends on right the marketplace, now. right? It, but it, yeah, you're in the right, you're in the all park, right? Yeah. So, so Denver, you know, this gets tough, but there are some suburbs of Long One and further out where you can do that, right? The the um, mean home price in Denver, for those of you who don't know, I live in Denver. It's five seventy five or so. Yeah, right now. And so we're, we we the starter home is four fifty. Right. Right. We launched in Raleigh, Durham, the, the research triangle, right? And you can buy homes for 350, got a couple in the 310, 320, right? And these are, these are two, three bedroom, 1400 square foot, you know, starter homes. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the on ramp, the program we've created is basically says we, you know, if the customer qualifies, we credit underwrite, we income underwrite, we give them a budget, they go out with the realtor, they pick a home. And then we buy the home on their behalf. Uh, and the customer on day one puts in 2% of the equity or 200 bricks. That's their 
down payment, if you will. And they commit to a five-year program during which they buy incremental bricks every month, roughly 13 bricks, at the then current market value of those bricks. So each home gets revalued every month and the transaction of bricks being transferred, just like you would buy shares in any other company or entity, is actually done at the current market value of those bricks. So let me dive in here for a second if I can. Yeah. So what you're saying is that you're revaluing the, I'm going to take the investor side. As an investor, we're basically buying in full the house in advance. Yep. The tenant, for lack of a better phrase. We call them the, the home buyer. The Oni. Because the Oni. Yeah. Okay. Onify, Oni, owner, Oni. The Oni owns, you said, 20 bricks initially, you're buying 13 or you're, 200. You're buying 13 per per month. Right. And is that in addition to or part of the rent they pay? It's in addition to. Okay. So they, so go ahead. you're evaluating this basically like a dollar cost average of a stock equity. That's exactly right. And so what we're allowing the customer to do is dollar cost average the purchase of their home or up to 10%. That's the way the math is dialed in over five over five years. So really it's a walk where the customer starts at 2%, they walk up to 10% of the equity in the span of five years, over 16 months, individual transactions. Now each transaction is done at the then current market value. So home prices bounce around, they go up, they go down. If they go down, your payment buys slightly more bricks. If they go, you know, home prices go up, your payment buys slightly um, fewer bricks, right? And so the net effect is that dollar cost averaging of the transactions um, to the point where the customer has 10%. Okay, Along and at, the way, the, at that point, what happens at 10%? So at 10%, you have enough equity to use that equity as a down payment for a traditional mortgage. So the customer has a choice, right? At any point along the way, and certainly at the end of five years, they can use that down payment, that 10% equity as a down payment for a mortgage and effectively buy the home from the investor pool. So they have a purchase right on the home at the future market value, right? And so that's the risk. That month 60's value, whatever month, month 60's value is. Correct. Exactly. And so there's a protection, you know, we put a floor under that price to ensure that the investor is protected. But so, so the golden path that this is really engineered for is customer builds equity for five years, has equity in the home, now uses that equity as a down payment for a mortgage, buys out the remaining equity, the 90% effectively from the investor pool and owns it the traditional way, right? And someone might have a 30 year fixed mortgage, they might have an FHA mortgage, whatever they can get. But the benefit to the customer is they're, they're, they have the purchase right in a non-competitive transaction. So they don't need to come up with, you know, um, a cash offer, they're not in a competitive bid scenario. So that's path one. Path two is they can continue and renew and say, I want to build another 10% equity. I want to renew for another five years. I stay in the same home, keep building equity in that way. Or at any point along the way, the customer can also leave and take their equity with them. Now, if they leave in the first five years, we charge them a relicensing, a relisting fee. So we buy back the equity and then relist the home and effectively sell it. Um, so if they do it at the end of five years, they can get bought out with their equity and effectively at that point we sell the home return the capital to the investor pool so it's a five-year program right for every home really optimized around this golden path where the customer the homeowner um, uses the equity as a down payment in a mortgage and and buys out the rest right so let's play the investor hat let's put on the investor hat right because that's who we're talking about so is is this a regulation 506C uh, offering, I would assume, because it's probably not anything but that because you're selling shares in essence. And it's almost – tell me how you guys have structured this. Yeah. So there are three components to this. Um, the first one is the sale to the ONI is a private sale, right? Okay. So that's under uh, 482, um, private sale transaction. It's not marketed, et cetera. The funding comes from investors, and investors uh, take two shapes. There is the 506C accredited investor that puts money into the Onify Home Fund. So that's a vehicle. That's an, a, that's an accredited investor, so it must be a, a verified, vetted, accredited investor. Exactly. And so it's a 506C. Uh, 
C with it with an A requirement on it. Or is it yeah. A or is it D? I can't remember. It's 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 A. Five oh six C A. It's the accredited you have to be yeah. an accredited investor. Right. Exactly. And so as an accredited investor, um and those are, you know, we've had, we have folks in the triangle, we have folks elsewhere in the US, right? Um, you invest into a fund and the fund holds bricks across all the homes in our portfolio. Mm -hmm. So you get this instant diversification. And while you're holding the bricks, they generate rental income and they generate home price appreciation. Obviously, that's not guaranteed, right? And there's risk in that, but it's a single family home. And so from an asset, you know, risk management perspective, it's relatively well understood. As a um, diversified risk pool. pool. As, a, as a diversified risk pool, exactly. The other thing we're working on, and this is still in the works, and so the SEC hasn't qualified it, um, is a Reg A exemption, which allows non-accredited retail investors to buy bricks either in the fund or directly in individual homes. Okay. And the reason we're doing that, uh, and again, that's not live yet, so this is not a solicitation that has us none of this in any way. And I'm not an attorney, and I'm not giving tax advice, and I'm not a registered investment advisor. And is there any other solution we need to put out there? No, we could put the fine print in the back, right? For, but, um, yes. but the reason we're doing the, the Reg A, working on the Reg A exemption, is that we would like to activate the community and community capital, right? Friends, family, community, church, folks that know the ONI and might be, you know, are not there to give a gift or um, you know, donate money for the purpose of buying a home, but might be willing to buy bricks in this very structured transaction where you get rental income and home price appreciation and all that, right? Under the uh, qualification of an SEC exemption, say, yes, I'm willing to buy bricks in David's home. I, I know him. I've known him forever. I trust them. This is going to be an interesting investment, potentially a good investment for me. So we want to activate that retail investor, right, who may actually know the ONI, as well as retail investors elsewhere. And so that's the Reg A exemption, which is the second path of um, putting investor capital into this. And, and that's not yet live, as we talked about, and that's something that's, you're working core and aspirational at this point in time. Great. So what is live, and this is kind of, this is a really interesting piece here, right? If you think about um, single family home or generally um, multifamily is the same same problem. If you think about the investment returns that happen, um, one of the things that we focus on with building this structure is to say, well, we're creating owners, right? Hence the name Ownerfy. And we are attracting people who have an ownership mentality and they are legally shareholders in the entity that holds title to the home, right? So this is done through an LLC and fractional ownership is done through shares in that LLC. So what does that mean if we can create this co-ownership? Um, and it means a couple of things, the, it, which ultimately all drive investor return. The first one means we can pick homes that generate uh, attractive rental yield and attractive home price appreciation. Right? And we can charge um, uh, market and you know close to top of market rental rates um, for this transaction because the ONI sees the optionality and the value of being able to pick a home that is not for rent today, right? pick a home that is on the market for sale and build towards owning it. So one that drives higher yield, rental yield, relative to just buying the same home and renting it out to the tenant. Two, what we found is we don't close on a transaction until we've gotten a committed ONI because they get to pick the home. So there's no lease up period. There's no vacancy up front. And because we've built this five-year program with equity ownership, we also don't expect um, vacancy throughout the term, right? So ultimately, that all returns back to the investor in the form of, uh, you know, depending on where you look at it, lower operating expenses or, you know, better rental performance. Three, and this is really interesting, over the last year, we've seen that we see about 60% lower uh, maintenance and repair costs in the portfolio because the ONIs are acting like co-owners, which is what you expected what we hope for, right? So they're fixing little things that, you know, taking care of the properties, they're painting, they're changing light bulbs, et cetera, rather than calling their landlord every time something happens, right? Which is ultimately is cost for, for the investor. So the net net is that compared to industry average over the last year, and again, this is early, so, you know, a small sample and all that, um, we've seen about 300 basis points higher operating return um, 
about 11.3, 11.4% relative to 8.3 or so um, SFR average on an unlevered basis, right? This is before any, any debt or mortgage costs, interest costs gets put into the transaction. And so the reason we're seeing that is because the, this co-ownership mentality, right, lack of vacancy, better payment performance, et cetera, ultimately all drives return for the investor. And that's the basis on which we believe we have built a, a path here, right, that is attractive to the first-time buyer because they get the lower down payment, they get an all-cash offer, they don't have to worry about maintenance, repairs, all that, right, for the first five years. They get the on ramp and the investor gets the yield enhancement and the return enhancement by effectively partnering with someone who behaves in a better way than your average single family rental tenant. So the fascinating thing about this is that you're you're hedging part of the return portfolio, if I understand you correctly, on the premise that the owner has equity, therefore they will behave like a true owner and not like a tenant. And you've proven this out in a 300, point, 300 basis point delta so far in what the, the theory is. And thus, if I understand where you're going with this, the investor has a safer risk adjusted return because of this. That's correct. That's exactly So right. the, the net is that Onify, if I'm jumping to the next natural assumption, is Onify believes that the mankind is basically good and will treat their own possessions in a positive manner. Yes. Um, Chief, that, that. Uh, let, let, me, let me say yes, but I will quote Ronald Reagan, trust but verify. So <laughs> what, what, what does that mean? This well, is, we're recording this the day that Mitch McConnell just announced he's stepping down as majority. Leader. I know the old, so yeah. there's a tremendous amount of all Reagan, kinds of political I, things going through my head. <laughs> right, right, right. So, no, so look, I spent four years at FICO and I worked on credit scoring engines and all that, right? And my co-founder uh, built a 5,000 home portfolio for another company. So he knows what happens when you have tenants that, you know, behave badly and what happens when you have evictions and, you know, all that. So, so you're helping to reduce moral hazard here. Well, that, so take that to the side because there's a really interesting moral hazard question. But so okay. on the trust, yes, we generally believe people are good, but we verify, right? And so right now we have an underwriting engine that looks at credit, looks at identity, looks at fraud, looks at uh, cash, income. We actually do bank uh, level, account level cash flow analysis to create the budget for the customer. And so far, the average FICO in the portfolio is 742. We've not had a single late payment. Right? So the quality of the customer that we're sourcing and underwriting is pristine. So and, then let's dig into this for a second, because, you know, for those of you that don't know what the average flight goes are like, what's the average flight go in the U.S. like, Frank? 680. 680? Yeah. Give and anything game. above 650 is considered in the real estate world writable. Yes. So yeah. what you're saying in a perfect FICO score is 850, yes? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. My wife always tells me how her FICO is better than mine, and I just look at her and say, be quiet. <laughs> she says no. <laughs> and and then I say we're fighting over two or three points. It doesn't matter. And, but a seven forty FICO basically says this is a really honest, trustworthy bill payer. Correct. So as I hear this, my whole brain has been going through the idea that your tent, you your own only profile is going to be a less credit worthy person than a 740 indicates. But that's the interesting thing. Yeah, clear that up for me. When you dig into the data, what's happening with first time buyers, right? So the first thing that's happening is house prices keep going up. So it's getting less and less affordable, right? Relative to incomes. That, and so everyone is subject to that. Second, you have a lot of people with student debt, right? You have more student debt weighing on first time buyers than ever before. And part of the reason for that is because student debt wasn't compounded into the equation until, was it 2020, 2018? Relatively recently, right? And so now mortgage lenders yeah. take either half a point or a point, right, of the outstanding balance and add them into the, the budget, the debt to income calculation. So you have student debt, that's the second one. You have mortgage rates at now reverting to their long run average, right? They, they're high right now. They're going to go maybe back down to the mid fives. But everyone They'll has to settle break. somewhere in the next 18 months in the fives. Right. But they're not going to go back to the twos and threes, right? So you have that kind of affordability hurdle. Um, you have, for first time buyers, the tax benefit of getting a mortgage basically got legislated away with the Tax Act in 2017. So you can and then still the question go back. comes does it, does it go sunset? 
I think it's supposed to sunset at 25. Correct. Potentially. Right. right. Potentially. Well, uh, well, government, who knows? Yeah. So, so you have the, the interest, uh, the, the um, intersection of um, the tax structure of mortgage, int mortgage interest. But I think the biggest issue that first time buyers have is that when they show up with an FHA mortgage, they've scraped together the down payment, they can make a monthly payment, they put in an offer, what happens? They get outbid by a cash buyer. And we see this time and time and time again, right, in the market that we launch. And so one of the big benefits that we're providing is this cash offer. So, so why would someone with a good credit score engage in this rather than saying, well, I'm going to keep saving? Right? There are basically three reasons why someone couldn't buy a home. The first one is they don't have sufficient income. We can't help with that, right? If you don't make enough money, you're not going to be able to buy a home. That's unfortunately the economic reality. Two, someone has poor credit, which means they've not been diligent enough to pay their bills on time. You know, maybe they don't care as much. Whatever. Everyone has their personal circumstances. Um, but we don't fix that for people. But there is a third segment, and that's the segment that has gotten larger and larger. For people, they have good incomes, but they have student debt. They've been diligent in paying their bills, so they have good credit, right? They just don't have the down payment. They haven't saved up enough to build a competitive offer in the market. And it's that piece, and we call them the missing middle, right? They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're teachers, uh, the public sector workers, they're firefighters, they're policemen, they're nurses, right? Those are the folks in our portfolio. We have software engineers and creative kind writers. Of like a, kind of like the Henry's, right? They're high income, net, not yet rich. That's exactly not right. Rich yet. And so yeah. they don't they don't need help in the sense of a down payment assistance program, right? Or they don't qualify for it. And they don't qualify for it. Because that's the other thing, right? This is you go back and say, well, there are mortgages that you know help people with lower incomes. Yes, if you're below eighty percent of area median income, that's when you can qualify for those mortgages. Um, but there is this this middle piece, we call them the missing middle, right? Who are people that you want to have in your community, they're great credit risk, they're good people to invest in, and that's the program that, that we build and that's the core focus. And so that's how ultimately, you know, we've been able to build this portfolio with, from a credit perspective, very, very high quality customers who have been performing, you know, very well. And I think that's a long-winded answer to saying, yes, we believe in the good in the world, but we've built an engine that tries to underwrite and select those people very carefully as well. Right? Note to so, self, when I ask for a question, it's going to be a five-minute answer. <laughs> I, so we, you know, out of every hundred applications today, we accept maybe two, right? So okay. that, that is fairly um, constrained still. Yes. So then, you know, Typically, I keep this podcast a half an hour. We're we're already over that, so I apologize to the listener. We keep listening to this. We're going to get to a little more meat in this potato stew. So, so tell me, Frank, as an investor, you're basically buying into a fund of funds, in essence, or into a pooled fund of securities. Mm -hmm. The ONI makes the cash offer. That doesn't need to have an escalation clause in it for appraisal gaps because it's a cash offer. Therefore, the the shortfall and the competitiveness is overrun by that. Yep. I'm put on a broker hat for a second. When I'm listing a house and I have three or four offers, I'm going to always recommend to my seller that they take the one that's the most assured to close. Correct. And what you're handling here is that assurance for that listing agent and that seller. And that's a core component of the 742 FICO user. It's a competitive advantage position. Correct. Yeah. It's a competitive so advantage. As an, so as an investor, what happens when the, if the market softens? So if the market softens, um, you own equity in a home that generates rental income, right? And generally, so it becomes a straight arbitrage play at that point, right? It so the home may lose value, of course, right? Um, and if the home loses value, two things happen: one, the only actually buys slightly more equity every month because the mm -hmm. price of bricks goes down. They can buy with the same payment; they can buy more bricks, right? So they may end up at eleven percent or so. Um, in an extreme scenario, they might end up at twelve percent at the end of five years. So you might lose two percent of your equity as an investor over kind of the pool. Along, along the way right and then the question right. is where do you believe house prices are five years from now right 
if you believe that they're going to be lower than today, right, then you shouldn't be investing in real estate. I think that's period. a long, right, period. I mean, same you're, making, you're, making the, you're making the play here. Uh, mathematically speaking to everybody, the average house has raised in average per annum by two and a half to three and a half percent nationwide since 1950. Right. On any given year. So what you're saying here is there's a 15 point delta at minimum. Correct. And, and there's a couple of other things going on, right? One is we obviously try to pick markets that are better than the national average, which is why we started in Raleigh. Two, if you look at the how home prices behave by price bracket, starter homes generally tend to do better, right? Because that's where household formation starts, right? And so there is a there's a support system there. And then the third thing we did is we put in place a very simple protection for the investor to say the only cannot buy the home for less than 105% of the entry price. So the purchase option is at the higher of whatever future market value or 5% above entry. Now, 5% in five years is not a it's great one return. It's 1% a year. So it's a, ter it's a terribly performing market. But in a terribly performing market, you have that floor, right? Right. So, so that um, protects the investor. And at the end of the day, the thesis here is that, you know, you have investors who have more capacity from a balance sheet perspective and in their individual, you know, financial situation. They have the capacity to, to ride out a, a home, a price, uh, drop in, in, uh, real estate, a first time buyer often doesn't. And I know we're over time, so I'm just going to be super quick on this. You mentioned David moral hazard, right? One of the interesting things about moral hazard is I used to use in the mortgage work I was doing. You you have someone buy a four hundred thousand dollar home with ten percent down, right? And then the home price falls to three twenty. So they put forty down, home price falls. Now their equity is worth negative forty. What do they do? They mail the keys to the bank, right? And and we call the jingle mail back in two thousand nine, two thousand ten, two thousand eleven. Because the way the mortgage works is there's no incentive for me to keep paying for something when my balance is higher than the value of the asset. What we've built right. with this equity based structure is the customer builds from 2 to 10%. Let's say they own 10% with that $400,000 home and the value goes down to $320,000. Their 10% is still worth $32,000. Right? Right. And so we've removed the moral hazard of them saying, I'm just going to walk away and stick the investors with the asset. Right. And that's a crucial element. That's part of why it, I'm a big fan of Michael Lewis and his writing. And that's part of yep. why you see the domino effects he laid out from the 2008 mortgage crisis. And this is a fascinating concept for me. All three of my hats are going full. Uh, my brain's going in three different directions here. I love it. Um, so as an investor, just out of curiosity right now for the, for the accredited 506C offering, what kind of minimum are you looking for? We're doing $25,000 minimum today into the fund. So if you are you taking those retirement funds as well in self directed IRAs, it's a little full in case of all the IRAs. Um, we also have folks coming in with their donor advised funds um, because mm -hmm. of the social mission construct here. We're helping people, right? So we've had uh, tax advantage five hundred one c three money go into this. We've had self directed IRAs and obviously cash go into this. Um, and if, yeah. so, then talk to me for a quick second about your growth plans. What's where? What's the next market? Uh, so Raleigh Durham today, Charlotte is next. Uh, Nashville, we're looking at uh, a couple of other markets. So the southeast, right? Generally, uh, we're looking for markets that have strong economic fundamentals, job creation, folks moving into these markets, and places where home prices are still reasonable but continue to appreciate, right? Which creates the demand from the consumer side and also the opportunity for the investor side, right? And this is this is a, at the end of the day a very regional thing, right? The, the the a lot of the early investors in the first fund really are focused on the the, the Raleigh Durham area, like the area, know the area, right? Local investors. It's home. Um, it's home, and they know, and they and they like the idea of I'm generating real estate returns, right? But I'm also helping my local community, and quite frankly, I'm not. You know, it's not Blackstone buying these homes. Right. Um, it's you know people in my community who should be living here. And so that's um, that's part of the thesis, which means our rollout and our growth plans, ultimately we want to be nationwide, are really focused around these metro markets where the fundamentals work and where first-time buyers want to live, right, and where they're struggling today to be competitive in the market. 
fascinating. So, I usually ask a whole bunch of questions. I'm going to fire them at you. Tell me, knowing what you know now, having been in the mortgage, what did you call it? The mortgage math? The bowels of mortgage. The math. bowels of the mortgage math. <laughs> and, and FICO and uh, selling SaaS solutions in the, in the financial fintech world. Um, what's one thing you know now that you wish you had known a decade ago? The how structurally slow our system is, and you know how innovation and solutions that that ultimately help people are often born outside of you know the big banks, the big government agencies, right? The institutions that are largely built and run by people who have depended on the status quo. And this is not something new, but it's just so visceral to me every time I talk to a local attorney or a real estate investor or someone who's like, well, but how can you do this? And I was like, why can't you? It was that, well, the I, was to you I interviewed a guy yesterday who's coming out in the episode before you, or two episodes before you. And it's for a company called rent.app. Yeah. And he is uh, lancing against title insurance. Yeah. There's no need for title insurance in, in essence. And he's right. Now, so, all my all my title insurance folks are going to be freaking out and calling me and yelling at me, and we can have that discussion offline. <laughs> but what you're really saying is, if I put it on a libertarian point of view, is that the systems function really slowly to break the systems. Because there, there's no incentive built in, right? right. No one who it's runs. a reverse. It, it, it's, it's eating your own arm. Exactly. And so there's so... And and everyone kind of knows that intuitively, but you know what I know now that maybe I wish I would have known ten years ago is just how constrained and how strong those constraints are, right? And how hard you have to work to get through them, and the and and how potentially great the rewards can be if you do it right. Yes, which is one of the reasons why all of us that are in this alternative real estate investing world are so passionate about get out of just. One element, get out of just buying what the broker says you have to buy. Yeah. Get out of just following the rule that says you must do A, B, and C to be successful. Love that. So the Congress of that is, is there a piece of advice you follow that you wish you would ignore? That I wish I would have ignored and didn't ignore? Um, well, I, you know, I, he can answer a, that over here. I'm not going to put that. Uh, no, you know, not, nothing comes to mind. That's okay. a good question. You know, it's I mean, especially like some of my friends, some of my guests, I'll say, I wish I'd ignored going to college and I hadn't gone because I spent so much money doing this, or I, I wish I had done this. And you never know what you're going to hear from people. So I love asking them. Yeah. Yeah. Two, two final questions. Is there a thought or a quote that moves you day in and day out that you like to share with our listeners? I mean, it's not a quote, but this notion of building companies is a marathon, right? And you've, you kind of talked about the marathon in the intro, right? And I think that's a lot of the things I learned maybe the hard way. It's, it it does take a long time, right? Persistence, staying power, grit, not running out of cat. All those things are so important, right? And so for the folks who are maybe more on the entrepreneurial side listening to this, right? It's just that persistence and not giving up that is so important, right? And if you do it right, you can achieve what, what in marathon world is called the negative split, right? Your second half is faster than your first half. That's the holy grail, right? All the really good marathon runners, not me, but the really good ones do it that way. So you finish stronger than you start, right? Um, but you recognize it's it's a long run. It's a you know it's a marathon rather than a sprint. I love that. I actually wrote that one down. I'm a long I'm a, I'm a road cyclist, so I'll do long roads as well. And, and got, it's the same thing. I'll do a hundred mile ride, and if you can get the last ten miles faster than the first ten miles, please, dear guy, let it be downhill. And then lastly, Frank, if someone's really enjoyed this conversation and wants to learn more, how do we get in touch with you? What do we do to learn more? So come to ownify.com, O-W-N-I-F-Y. We make owners, Ownify. Um, I'm at frank at ownify.com. So email me. And I don't know if you share phone numbers, they would be happy to hand up my phone number as well. But that's the easiest way to get it's in touch with It's up to you. This goes out. So, sure, yeah. Call me at 415-549-1939, and I'm happy to walk you through what we're doing, right? If you're interested in investing, happy to talk you through that as well. And obviously, all of that content and information is on our website um, as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us, Frank. This has been a, a, a true pleasure, and you've been listening to another episode of Bicker Golden Handcuffs. Thank you, Eric.